But before we begin our Bible study, we're going to allow a few moments of silent time where you can pray and represent yourself before the throne of grace. It's a time to use the rebound technique if needed, which is 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So let's bow our heads together for a few moments and I'll finish this out in a group prayer. And we're studying through the tribes of Israel. We saw there was a threefold interpretation to each tribe. The person in general, the tribe in general, and then a prophecy concerning a future time. And we're going to apply these tribes to different segments of time at the end. I'm going to show you where each one of these tribes fit in um, in history. Some of it has already happened, and, and some of it is a future time. And so this is actually prophetic in nature in the third part of the application or interpretation. And we're going to continue tonight by looking at a new tribe. In verse 8, we see Judah. It says, Judah, you are, you are he whom your brother shall praise. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's whelp. From prey, my son, you have gone up. He bows down, he lies down as a lion. And as a lion, who shall rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor lawgiver from between his feet. Until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people, binding his donkey to the vine, and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine, and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine, and his teeth whiter than milk. So, what does it all mean? Let's take a look at it. The meaning of the word in the Hebrew, Judah, is he who shall be praised. He who shall be praised. It means that God would receive praise from Israel. Judah also is the ruling tribe of Israel, the tribe from which David came, and the tribe through which the humanity of Christ was brought into the world. Remember both uh, his father in his humanity and his mother were both from the tribe of Judah. Thy brethren refers to the Jews, and the Jews would honor the tribe of Judah as the ruling tribe. This is brought out through the Davidic covenant in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 8 through 16, and Psalms 89, verses 20 through 37. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies, means that Judah was the conquering tribe. There's a writing of the Talmud or extra biblical writing that comes from this concept. And uh, the Jews' teaching from the law of Moses says uh, one of the axioms um, was, He who wants to kill you, kill him first. And it's speaking of war. And America has been good at it. Rather than waiting for our enemies to invade and kill us here, we've waited to see who is, who is chanting death to America. And we've gone and we've taken our military men and put them over there and see who arrives to shoot at us. And then you know who your enemy is. And... Um, I believe it's a good concept. It comes from 
this idea, and it means that your population gets to live in peace, and you get to fight your enemy on a foreign battlefield, which many times brings a lot of destruction, and uh, you keep your own country from being destroyed. And so Judah, it says, Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. So they were a not only a ruling tribe, but they were a, a good tribe of soldiers. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. And this is the prophecy of the fact that Reuben lost the rulership, remember, through instability. It was passed to Judah. Judah is a lion's whelp is the next phrase. That means a young lion. A young lion has great power and vigor. In fact, one of the titles for the Lord Jesus Christ is the Lion of the tribe of Judah, Revelation 5.5. 5. It's amazing if you watch any of these documentaries about the big cats in Africa. Um, when a, a, a male lion gets to a certain age, he gets run out of the pride. And so in Africa, you get bands of young male lions and they're roving around and they hunt together and they're uh, many times it lasts for a, a long time and these bands of lions they start understanding how powerful they are and it is uh, they you know there's a lot of incidents where people have witnessed these lions taking down buffalo and even elephants taking down an elephant a young band of male lions and so their power is phenomenal and here it is pointing to the omnipotence of jesus christ as the lion of the tribe of judah and he shall smash and devour uh, upon his second advent from pray that my son thou art gone up in other words, he always gets his prey. He stooped down, he crouched as a lion, and as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? The indication here is that there would be a period as a crouched lion laying down as an old lion. There would be a time when the tribe of Judah would not rule Israel. This is a prophecy of the fact that when the Babylonian captivity took place, the last king in the family of David, that is Zedekiah, no longer ruled. When the Jews came back from captivity, they were ruled by a member of the tribe of Judah, but not as king. From the beginning of the Babylonian captivity until the second advent of Jesus Christ, no member of the tribe of Judah would ever sit on David's throne. The old lion no longer going out to hunt is a picture of Judah no longer reigning. God said to David that he would have a son who would reign forever and ever. That son is Jesus Christ. The Davidic covenant will be fulfilled and perpetuated into eternity. It's funny because when you think of the Babylonian captivity and you think of the Jews losing their country, you, and then you ask yourself why, and there was, a, there was a definite answer. They stayed out of the years. They stayed out of the country for 70 years because God said, you didn't give the land the Sabbath year of rest. And for all this time, I've been counting up, and it's been 70 years that the land didn't get its rest, and that's how much you owe me, 70 years and so I'm kicking you out for 70 years, and the, the land's going to get its rest. Isn't that amazing? How God is clear when he gave the law of Moses. He said, every seventh year you shall not plow. Don't touch it with a piece of steel. You just, if anything comes up voluntarily, you can have it. But you let it rest every seven years. It was the Sabbath year, and the Jews didn't give it rest, and then Afterwards, he says, okay, I'll let it rest. Y'all can go cool your heels in Babylon. 
The next phrase is, who shall rouse him up? This refers to Jesus Christ. And uh, the, I think the answer, the question there is that who would dare want to rouse a lion and see it charge? And that is the fury of uh, Jesus Christ at the second advent. By the way, he is going to instigate, he's going to instigate his rule in the millennium with warfare. Warfare. He is going to come back and through warfare, he is going to clean his kingdom up and he is going to instigate his rule through military effort. Who would rouse Jesus Christ? In other words, who wants to go to war with him? And the answer is, only people who use their volition in a negative way. That is who. Verse 10, the scepter is rulership shall not depart from Judah. It means that the second advent, the line of the tribe of Judah will return to the earth to reign. Even though Judah is not actively on the throne today, the rulership shall not depart from this tribe. Until Shiloh come, or Shiloh as we call it in, in the south, Shiloh is Jesus Christ. Shiloh here, the Hebrew word can mean peace. That's what the kernel says this indicates is peace. It comes from Shalom. But if you study anywhere else, you'll see that the meaning says to whom it belongs. And so I'll give it to you. You can figure out which one you like better. It refers to the second advent of Christ. And both of them uh, communicate to me because the reign of Jesus Christ is going to be uh, perfect peace and you're not going to need any defensive weapons during the millennium and he is going to instigate peace through capital punishment and uh, also at the second advent the world belongs to him and he's going to conquer and claim it the next phrase and unto him shall the gathering of people be this is a prophecy of how the Jews will be regathered at the second advent I love the uh, vision of one of the verses, I think it may be in Isaiah, it says, He will whistle. He'll whistle for the believing Jews to meet Him in Israel. And uh, while they are displaced now around the world, a loud whistle. And His friends will meet Him. Verse 11, what will the land be like when Jesus returns? And this is what the phrase is. It means binding his foal unto the vine, his ass his colt unto the choice vine. They're going to be so prosperous in the day that they can actually tie animals to vines and the animals can't get loose. In other words, the land is so thick with grapevines are so strong that's a agricultural idiom of prosperity uh, and if you know anything about grapevines they're right now they're extremely hard to tend and you've got to you got to have the proper kind of soil and, and drainage uh, is very important to grapevines and most of the it takes a mountainous type of soil and, and well-drained soil in the right type of sun and, and climate and uh, all of these things. But during the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, the grapevine is going to be so plentiful that you'll be able to latch your horse to it when you pull up and uh, you won't even have to have a rope. I always, and, and this verse makes me think of the uh, the party that went into the promised land to see if it was a good land and what did they do they had to carry the grape clusters out between two men and a stick a staff now that is a good land so when you're talking about fertile soil you're talking about that good mountain dirt 
and the proper climate to raise the grape. Well, it'll be so fertile, he goes on and says, he washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. The wine is so plentiful, it's like water. In other words, it's an agricultural symbol for prosperity. And if you think of how much wine costs now, if you actually have wine that's prepared correctly, it's very expensive. And uh, here it says it's like water. So we cover the idea of Judah. And we know that Jesus Christ is going to fulfill the Davidic covenant as the lion of the tribe of Judah. And um, the thing it reminds me of is, is three Ambrose. And uh, Jesus is going to return. And the Bible says at his advent, he will roar like a lion across the plains and I can't wait to hear that roar and uh, while we may have had some good leaders in America we've never had anyone lead in the world like Jesus Christ will do and we can finally be proud of our leader and we can tell everyone that we meet truly this man is sent from God, and he is righteous. And uh, but we haven't really been able to say that uh, any time upon the earth. In verse 13, we start a new tribe, a new man, Zebulun. It means dwelling or protective habitation, a haven. He represents the type of person like you like to have around a steady type of person, a person who is comforting, who can be helpful in time of stress and difficulty. He is actually the tenth son of Jacob, and we're not down to number ten yet. So we know from this point on in the order in which the sons appear is significant because it is not chronological. Zebulun is placed here for a reason. During the first advent of Jesus Christ, Satan sought to destroy Jesus Christ as a baby. Joseph had to flee to Egypt, where he stayed until Jesus was 12 years old. When he came back to the land, he was warned not to go to Judea. All children were regarded with great suspicion because one of them was thought to be Messiah. And every attempt was being made by Herod to destroy Messiah. Instead, he was to go to Galilee, which was the territory of, guess who? Zebulun. Zebulun is mentioned next to uh, next because Jesus Christ from 12 to 33, found refuge in Galilee. He was protected there. By way of application, Zebulun speaks of the type of person who is thoughtful of others. The person who is capable of mental attitude love. The person who is a shelter for weaker people around. A shelter in time of storm. So I like Zebulun, and um, I think a grace mental attitude and thoughtfulness for others is a one of the key components in in the Christian life. And doing good unto others who cannot pay you back and do not deserve it is the idea of a grace mental attitude, and I believe Zebulun portrayed that. In Judges 5, 8, and 1 Chronicles 12, 33, soldiers from Zebulun also stood, always stood in the ranks and did not give way. This means they were stable under pressure. 
Here's an excerpt from these passages. Zebulun shall dwell at the haven of the sea, and he shall be for an haven of ships. His border shall be unto Zidon. Zebulun had the seaports of the land, which were havens from the great storms which occurred in the Mediterranean. There were many ports, and this reminds us that there were many doctrines, many promises, many things by which we can help people who are weak and helpless and who need encouragement and need to lean upon us. Therefore, to be a Zebulun, there must be an overall understanding of doctrine and the Word of God. Sidon was a Gentile, unregenerate, false religious group. Principle. A person who is a Zebulun is stabilized and does not fall apart in time of crisis, and he does not succumb to false doctrine, even though it's right at his border, see. And if you ever thought of the map and looked at northern Israel the way it laid in that day, you would know that the Mediterranean Sea is there to the west and is a beautiful part of the sea. And it was really the entrance where a lot of ships might have headed right, head right over to Europe from there. And uh, so many of its ports were well used and in times of trouble many ships would find refuge there. In verse 14, we find a new son and a new tribe. Issachar. Issachar means he will bring reward. He's the ninth son of Jacob and the fifth one by Leah. He is listed last among the sons of Leah because of what is said right here. Issachar is a picture of a person who has great potential but doesn't use it. A strong donkey or ass. The ass was a very honorable animal at the time of this writing. And also one of great strength and great usefulness. This is taught in Judges 10. Four and Judges twelve fourteen. A donkey is a great animal uh, for going up mountains on. They have mountain legs, and um, I had a friend of a friend who had a donkey that he would go hunting on, and he would he lived in hill country and he would ride the donkey up and down the mountains hunting for deer. And if you know anything about deer, they don't spook when they hear a four-legged animal coming. And that, that donkey, he said it would go over any mountain and never start breathing hard. He said it was amazing to ride a donkey over a mountain. So it was the four-wheel drive of the day, and they were used for pack animals and traveling. And it was really the Cadillac of the day to have a donkey. And we might be able to, we would probably learn a whole lot more about living on earth if we all had a donkey to ride. Um, and somehow we have degenerated to vehicles, but looks like that's about to be over with too. Imagine all the people stuck in the snowstorm in an electric car. They'd all be dead. Thank you very much. Crouching down is the Hebrew word that means reclining. In other words, he won't carry his burden, burdens. Issachar was a person who, first of all, had no sense of responsibility. A believer who has no sense of responsibility is a believer who is going to fail miserably. He had the strength to carry his burdens and wouldn't do it. Reuben was noble but unstable. Issachar was strong but unstable. So we see again the principle. When a believer does not have a sense of responsibility, it leads to great instability. And that's to many of you, and I thank all of you for taking responsibility of supporting this ministry. I so wish there were, there were men of my generation who were willing to step up and say, look, 
I know this teaching is right, and I know that it is my responsibility to show up and to support this kind of teaching, whether it is my presence, or whether it is my support financially, or by prayers, or just by uh, sharing a video from this ministry. I, I wish so badly that there was uh, my generation, they're not. They're absent. They're not here. And uh, I want to thank all of you who do support the ministry. And you are not an Issachar. You are, you've, you've found your responsibility. And that uh, whether you support me in prayer or otherwise or just showing up, it means so much to me. There's another principle here. The potential strength is not used. This car is a person who has great power but will not use it. This depicts the carnal believer today who has the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, but when he is not filled with the Spirit and in the carnal status, he is not using the great power which he can possess. Reclining between two burdens, the purpose of the donkey was to carry the burdens, one of which was carried on each side. When a believer does not use the power which God has provided for him, then he fails. He falls into the pattern of verse 15. It says, He saw that rest was good and the land was pleasant, and he bowed his shoulder to bear a burden and became a band of slaves. So in verse 15 it says, And he saw rest was good. Rest means prosperity. The tribe of Issachar, by the way, became a very prosperous tribe. A person who will not utilize divine power has a false scale of values. And this was the third problem of Issachar. He put materialistic things first. Success in the world first. He suffered from approbation lust and from power lust. The principle is the substitution of natural power for divine power and the substitution of natural ability for divine provision. In the land that it was pleasant, that means prosperous, or the land that was occupied by Issachar, he bowed his shoulders to bear. And that means the donkey squat. He squatted down and the, the bags hit the ground and he said, oh. Right here, it looks like a good place. And uh, have you ever heard the phrase, I'm going to light a fire under you? And, and, you know, an old mule or a donkey pulling a cart, sometimes they would just, they'd go, they'd go to sleep there and you could not make them move. You would you'd whip the reins to try to get them to go. And you'd pop the whip and they'd stand there like in a, a zombie state and would not move. Well, the last uh, choice a man had was to kindle a fire underneath the donkey or underneath the mule, and then they would move. And so the phrase, I'm going to light a fire under you, means you're going to get moving one way or another. And uh, I've heard many a story of lighting a fire under a mule where the mule had the wagon still hooked on, and he simply stepped forward two or three steps and now the fire was under the wagon. And he stopped and wouldn't move again. Now you've got to put out the fire. Well, this donkey bowed his shoulders to bear. That means he became a slave. This is the history of the tribe as well as having a, pers a personal principle. Iskar is one of the most fertile areas in the land of Israel. The land which they occupied. Under an agricultural economy, they were very successful. And because they were very prosperous and very successful, when the time came to resist the infiltration of the enemy, they refused to do so. They just simply bowed down and said, What a beautiful land we have. I'll just soon sit here and enjoy it. Not worry about too much else. Well, guess what? We're being infiltrated as we speak. 
And the kinds of people that are coming here are not coming here as good people. They're coming as criminals. And I hate to think about it. Why is our police forces concerned with frivolous crime when we have bands and troves of criminals crossing the border? They're criminals by nature. We're crossing the border, and we have... We have legal ways to immigrate to this country, legal ways. And if you were concerned about our law in America at all, you would be trying to immigrate legally. And by the way, what says that you can't say, stay in your own country and make it better? And the truth is, these people are here for a free ride. Many Americans are like Issachar. And they're simply enjoying the prosperity we have today and not willing to stand up and fight an enemy overrunning their own country. Well, our elected politicians are supposed to be solving this problem, and uh, they're doing a very poor job. They didn't want to fight or resist. They did not have the right scale of values and freedom wasn't important to them. Prosperity was more important than freedom, and consequently the, pri the tribe of Iskar bowed their neck to slavery. They made a deal with the invaders, whoever came in, and simply paid them off and became their slaves. This continued during the entire history of the tribe of Iskar. In other words, they loved prosperity more than they loved freedom. The application to the individual believer is obvious. If you have a false scale of values, it destroys several things. First of all, it destroys the use of divine power. There's no appreciation of divine operating assets. He doesn't use rebound or the faith rest technique. The promises and doctrines which provide inner happiness and power. Therefore, not using inner resources and power, he becomes one who is interested only in the superficial one who is only interested in the materialistic. Therefore, often one who suffers from materialism lust or approbation lust or power lust. Therefore, the result is a very miserable creature. So Issachar had all of this power and didn't use it. Just as every believer has tremendous potential power, failure to use what God has provided through grace means that the believer will use the alternative, the alternative or superficial activities connected with this life, and the result is a very miserable believer. So we see that Iskar was, he was powerful as the most powerful piece of equipment a man could own back then, and that was the four-wheel drive of the day, the donkey. But he refused to use his own power. And this, of course, for the believer in the church age, we've been, get, we've been given more power and more divine operating assets than any believer of any other dispensation. And the great tragedy is this principle. To whom, to whom much is given, much is expected. To whom much is given, much is expected. Well, don't be in his car. Now we move on to the sons of Bilhah. The first one who is mentioned in verses 16 to 18 and 21 is Dan. Dan is one of the worst of all the tribes of Israel. I'm going to see if I can... I think I'll just read uh, through 16 through 18 in my New King James. It says, Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent by the way, a viper by the path that bites the horse's heels so that the rider shall fall backwards. I have waited your salvation for your salvation, O Lord. So what does it mean? 
First of all, we have the fact that Dan is going to rule in the future, and this has to do with the tribulation. Isn't it funny? The false prophets and is not going to come uh, from Judah. The false prophet is going to uh, come from the tribe of Dan. Uh, we know that the Antichrist is going to come from Europe somewhere or the Ten Nation Federation. And uh, we do not yet know who he is or what country he comes from. Uh, we do know that uh, he will try to fix the financial problem. And uh, so Dan here is the tribe of the leader of Israel in the tribulation the word judge means to rule right up to the time that israel was dispersed this is the history of dan he was described as a snake and this is an adverse description even the day which it was written dan always brought up the rear in israel's as they marched through the desert in numbers ten twenty five. dan was the first tribe to go into idolatry judges eighteen thirty. Dan was the last tribe to receive an inheritance in the land. Joshua 19 verses 47 through 49. Dan is mentioned last on every list that involves merit. For example, in 1 Chronicles 27, we have a list of the tribes according to merit, and Dan is last. Dan is not even mentioned in the list of tribes in Revelation 7 in connection with evangelism and the tribulation. There will be no evangelist from the tribe of Dan in the tribulation. Dan is omitted from the genealogies of 1 Chronicles chapters 2 through 10. All of this adds up to the fact that Dan was a very poor tribe in Israel. Jacob prophesied specifically with regard to the tribulation, tribulational dictatorship, the Antichrist or the dictator of Israel in the tribulation, and I, that that's really a typo. It's a dictator of Israel. The Antichrist is going to be Gentile. Remember, the beast of the sea is the Antichrist, and he's going to come out of the Gentile nations of the world. And the beast out of the earth is the dictator or leader of Israel, and that's who we're speaking of. Out of the land, the earth is Israel. Dan, which is why Dan is not mentioned in Revelation chapter 7. In verse 17, you see that Dan shall be a serpent by the way, an adder in the path that biteth the horse's heels so that the rider shall fall backward. The horse refers to Israel in the tribulation. And Dan is the one who is going to destroy the Jews the believing remnant in the tribulation, or seek to, to do so. The rider is the Jewish remnant of the tribulation, and the serpent is the false prophet. That's better. The beast out of the land, Revelation 13. Now we corrected ourselves. So here we have the dictatorship of Dan, and it does not occur until the tribulation. In verse 18, the believers in Israel, the remnant, offer this cry when Dan starts to oppress them. I have waited for thy salvation. That's deliverance, O Lord. In other words, this is the cry of the remnant waiting for the second advent of Christ when the remnant shall be delivered from the dictatorship of Dan. Uh, and, and that's what it's like to be under a bad uh, ruler. Uh, look, we can cry out the same cry under a terrible leader. And it really truly is. It can, can uh, cause a heartbreak in the soul. And I feel like um, I the verse 18, it says, I have waited for your salvation, O Lord. And who a uh, patriotic American has not in some sense uttered this prayer in our recent days. 
So there, in the historical sequence, Dan depicts an apostate Israel under the Antichrist in the tribulation. There is an application, and it has to do with religion. Religion is the worst persecutor of truth. Satan is the author of religion. Religion is his greatest weapon. It is his ace trump. Religion is used to seek to neutralize the effectiveness of a clear witness for Jesus Christ. All of this comes from Dan in the tribulation. Well, it's amazing that we know what's going to happen in the tribulation. First of all, this false prophet is going to be able to make fire fall from the sky and to make a statue speak and so that people are going to follow him because of uh, miracles. And believers today are hung up on experience instead of Bible doctrine. They want to have a religious experience. And whether they're standing around and they're chiming the same verse all together in some kind of witch's seance, trying to drum something up, Oh, Holy Spirit, oh, Holy Spirit come. We're here, come. And uh, it's amazing. Or whether they are into some healing service or speaking tongues or anything of an ecstatic nature. Guess what? They didn't study their Bible to see that they're worshiping a God and it's their own guts. Emotional pattern, splaclon. And people in the tribulation are going to fall into the same trap. Religious experiences of an ecstatic nature. Well, it's amazing to see how many Christians don't study prophecy or their Bibles and are falling into the trap right now and they hate boring Bible class. The only thing that would deliver them from such atrocities. And uh, they'll just continue making mistakes all the way up to, unto either the rapture or death as long as they reject Bible doctrine. Well, I'm thankful for you all because <clears throat> through doctrine we sidestep many a misery. And uh, I'm thankful for the truth of God's Word myself.